welcome back to the show, the second half of today's live episode, talking now about the Los Angeles Rams and their draft scenario. Before I do that, however, one last time in this episode, if you have any questions or comments, use the tip and donations link, gsmcpodcast.net, with any of your questions or comments. Using this link that you see on your screen or running across the ticker down below makes it able for me to see your questions pop up, read them out loud on air, and make it more engaging, make it more fun for me, in all honesty. It's a big help for the show. Again, if you use the tip and donations link, gsmcpodcast.net, with any of your questions or comments, we greatly appreciate it every time you guys are able to do that for us. In saying that, back to the Los Angeles Rams and how their draft scenario is looking a lot different for them and specifically for Sean McVay. Sean McVay has been the coach, I don't know if many people know this, for the Rams for the last seven seasons. And in those seven seasons, he has never had a first round pick of his own to start a new year, to start training camp, OTAs. He's never had a guy that he picked in the first round to start a new year, which is crazy. When I read that, um, I had to bring it up. Because of the success that they've had with Sean McVay and how relevant they've stayed, it's mind-blowing that they haven't even had a chance to draft someone in the first round. Because of the trends that their general manager, Lee Snead, kind of has built up for himself, this reputation of trading away the picks like they did to get Matthew Stafford, Um, gambling away their future in these picks. It panned out for them. They won the Super Bowl, but, I mean, there's no real buts. I I just said that they have been successful. I think it's worked out, but now you have another first-round pick finally, and there's a good opportunity for them to get some more quality on this team. Um, I mentioned it was the, this is the first time since 2016 that they have a first-round pick, And it's the 19th overall selection. And they're in a similar spot with the Steelers where teams, I'm sure, will call them to inquire about that pick and what their feeling is around moving from there, moving back, and acquiring more talent, which has been the M.O. of Lee Sneed so far. And on his mindset, Lee Sneed talked about it back at the owners meeting a little bit more recently as well, how he values what his mindset is with some of these trades and trying to maneuver his way around the first round. On that and on their mindset, he said, there are scenarios where, right, if you move back, move up, maybe there's a chance you get three players in the first round and and in the second round versus only two. Then there's a possibility you only end up with one, right, if you move up. He broke it down a little bit there in that interview. And it makes sense from that standpoint. You always wonder why GMs are moving so much in the first round, why someone would move back. When there's so much talent left where they are, why people are just left confused as to why they're going to pass up on that potentially. It's all about that value that Lee Sneed mentioned, getting three players instead of just one in the first round, getting two players close to each other in the first or second round, rather than only getting one early in the first round and then another one in the middle of the second round, right? You get them a bit closer together, and there's more value in that. It makes sense. I've wondered about it as well. He broke it down in a very simple, logical way. And since since Lee Sneed has been on the job, he got the job back in 2012. Funny enough, since then, they've only chosen players in the first round in five drafts since 2012. We're going on 12, 13 years since then. To only pick five times in the first round really shows how much he is active in the draft on this first day of the NFL draft on April 25th. Starting at 8 o'clock, the first round will begin then. Looking back on those selections that he's made, again, it's pretty much panned out for him in selecting in the first round when he's had the opportunity to. Back in 2012, he selected Michael Brockers, defensive tackle, 14th overall. Then, probably the most popular, second most, Tavon Austin at number 8, and Alec Ogletree at 30 in 2013. 
Then Greg Robinson, they selected second overall, as well as Aaron Donald, 13th overall in 2014. Then this one surprised me, Todd Gurley, 10th overall in 2015. If you if you went back to 2015 and saw running backs going top 10 to where it is now, it, it would completely shock a lot of people. And that pick might look like a complete disaster, depending on how you look at it, how it all panned out now that Todd Gurley's not in the league. You can see why he was that starting point of people, the devaluing of running backs from him, and how he, I think he's still, I think he's younger than Derrick Henry, I think I saw somewhere, and he is, hasn't played in the league for a good amount of years now, and it's crazy how he sort of started that trend, not only with being picked 10th overall, but then wanting that big contract that first round picks usually get as a running back. People started to question the traction on the tires, how much do they have left in them. And he, going back to 2015, sort of started that whole thing along with Le'Veon Bell and others and how that running back value market just sort of shifted from that point on. Then their most recent selection in 2016 was Jared Goff. They ended up trading him. But for the most part, Ogletree, Tavon Austin, Aaron Donald, Michael Brockers, they've all not been uh, just awful picks, bust by any means. They've gotten good value for those picks. And now, with the retirement of Aaron Donald, you look at this draft, it stresses the need for finding a pass rusher even more because Aaron Donald's not there. They were fortunate to find guys like Kobe Turner, Byron Young, from last year's draft class that gave him a good amount of production back. But other than that, now on top of trying to find a spot for Aaron Donald, his replacement, you still have defensive back as a need, linebacker, wide receiver still behind Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. That would be an area to address maybe in the later rounds. Tight end as well. But the good thing about them is that they have 11 picks this year, a lot more than some teams have in the total seven rounds that there is in the NFL draft. So they could use that to their advantage if they want to move up. It's ironic now, right? Because this year, they sit in a spot where the value at 19, they would want to move maybe out of the first round. And it's just ironic because they haven't had a pick in the first round. They've been waiting to have this pick. And now, because of the way it's all panned out, the value there isn't really great. I think the best bang for their buck at that pick could most likely be a defensive tackle. Byron Murphy, the defensive tackle from Texas, is in that range. I've seen him be mocked a lot in the early 20s, mid-20s, early at 16, at 17. So if he falls to 19, you could instantly try and replace Aaron Donald with him in that middle of your defensive line. But with 11 picks, you could try and trade up. That's another option that I'm sure Lee Snead hasn't really completely disregarded moving up for a defensive back I think again is a great option if they use three maybe two picks that they have out of those 11 to move up along with the 19th overall pick with the Broncos who could use it then you have the Raiders again who could also use it if they're not going to go quarterback or offensive line that could be enticing for them for you to go up and grab one of the top defensive backs, a top pass rusher if they need to, or tight end. If Brock Bowers is still there, try and trade up to number 10 with the New York Jets and assure yourself that you're going to get a X-factor, exciting player like Brock Bowers in your team. Then you don't really need too much wide receiver depth and you kind of kill two birds with one stone there in getting Brock Bowers because he can move everywhere same with Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua. That would be another intriguing option as well. But right now they sit in a spot where I'm sure Lee Sneed is exploring all these options. will take account of all the picks that he has. What he can get later in the rounds with trades with the Bills, the Commanders, like I mentioned. All these teams really past 18, starting with the Rams at 19, could all... 
I wouldn't be surprised. Move back a few spots, move up, got get guys from the second round to move up as well. The value right now, because it's so deep at all these classes, people evaluate these prospects differently. Almost everybody has different boards. No one has the exact same board as another team. It all filters in on how they determine who's better than the next. If they really want them, if they feel another team's going to get them, trying to trade up and all that stuff like that. The Rams are, again, in a good spot where, yeah, they haven't had a first-round pick in a while, but where they sit right now to wrap this all up, trying to find their best bang for their buck to try and really get the best out of Matthew Stafford. He is on the older side, and you're still getting good production out of him, but he certainly hasn't doesn't have another four years, three years left in him. I would say probably max two, if not next year being his last year. You have to maximize that as much as you can to fill out this roster with the best talent, to make sure you can go further. They have great stepping stones to do that. Kyron Williams, Puka, Cooper Cup, Kobe Young, or Kobe Turner, and Byron Young. All solid pieces to build on. Now you just have to refine it a little bit with this year's draft and get better because Matthew Stafford, once he moves on, then you have an even bigger problem potentially than Aaron Donald moving on. So that's where the Rams sit right now, trying to figure all that out to compete in the NFC that, again, is wide open. I think most of those teams can compete, and you can't predict right now who's going to finish where in the NFC, which makes it more exciting and more conversational to keep talking about this throughout the offseason and into the regular season as well. But in the meantime, we're going to leave it there. We're going to go into the final break, a short one. And after that, we're going to come back and talk about the Cowboys more and specifically their star wide receiver, C.D. Lamb, heading into the final year of his contract and how the Cowboys can maneuver around that so it doesn't become an even bigger problem for them. More on that story coming up in just a few seconds. Stick around to watch on the GSMC Chip Shot Football Podcast.